Welcome to Living Outside the Matrix, the show for thinking people where we explode the many modern myths and question some important issues in the mainstream narrative. Hi there, I'm your host, Nigel Howitt, and on the show today we're going to look at something called permaculture. Permaculture can be used as a means of land management, it can be used as a philosophy for life, and most importantly it can be used as a means of problem solving. It's an essentially rational way of learning from nature, from natural systems that have evolved over millennia. Very interesting topic, which I think should be on, on everyone's radar, who wants to thrive. So with me to discuss this uh, exciting topic is Aranya. He is from uh, Devon, and he's been teaching permaculture design courses for about the last 15 years or so. He's also written a book called Permaculture Design, a step-by-step -step guide and he's a mine of information about this wonderful topic. So thank you very much for joining us today, Aranya. Really, really appreciate you taking the time and a very warm welcome to the show. Thank you. Perhaps you could uh, start us off um, by letting us know a little bit about your backstory. Um, how is it you managed to, to, to get into this, um, this t topic of permaculture? I first came across it um... In a period after leaving university, I'd done a physics degree and I wasn't really sure what to do. I'd been applying for jobs that I didn't really want, you know, and missile guidance systems and that kind of thing, were the kind of things that were floating around. I didn't want to do any of that. So um, I ended up uh, going to an animal rescue center to volunteer for a while while I was applying for jobs. But what happened was I stayed there for five years and it just was a whole amazing kind of first next step of my life getting back into my body, learning about how to care for nature and animals. And and while I was there, somebody visited who was a permaculture designer, and she was from the, the Netherlands, but she was traveling around doing little bits of design, and she came to stay for a while. And she had the first two permaculture books, and there was a photocopier. <laughs> so I just ran them over the photocopier. And uh, Robert Hart's very first ever forest gardening booklet when it was a little typed thing and very small. And they all seemed very exciting to me. And I was totally distracted by animals coming at me from all directions that we were having to look after. So it, it went on hold for a while. And, um, and then later on, so I worked for the National Anti-Vivisection Society after that for another five years, um, which was good because it was, I mean, it was really tough because of this stuff that, you know, the subject matter we were talking about. But it really helped me to get some confidence and some training in standing up and talking about things. And then after that, I went to, I got involved with the Raw Food Network. Yeah. And the house we were staying in was uh, one of my co home person, you know, one of the people that lived in the house was Steve Charter. And he was learning permaculture. So he invited a permaculture teacher to come and teach a course in our house okay. uh, in the shared house. And I thought, okay, probably it's caught up and, <laughs> and I should do something about it. And uh, sometimes, you know, people say this thing changed my life, but it literally did because from that point on, I was left in this place of thinking, well, what do I do with that? Because that's amazing and there's so much of it and where do I go from here? And that took me on a journey that involved going to Ireland for a year and living literally just off the land, growing our own food, water from a wellspring, no electricity, no money, no shoes. <laughs> <laughs> it was a bit radical in many ways, but also a huge learning experience for me. And that was the beginning of my journey of trying to make sense of how do I take this permaculture thing that I was learning about and applying it to my life. And then having done that, um, I felt very isolated there because there was only three of us living there permanently. So after a year, I came back to England and went and saw a whole bunch of people who were very interested in permaculture and realized that I needed to come back and basically uh, go and tell people about it and I made some gardens and then eventually about seven years down the line after my design course I started teaching I finished my diploma and started teaching so um, and that was in 2003 2004 um, and I can't believe that's that's 14 years ago <laughs> <laughs> Where did it so go? you've been designing permaculture setups and teaching since then Yes. I mean, essentially, my focus has been mostly on small scale. So I made, I, I had a period of being 
kind of quite nomadic of moving from place to place. So I kept acquiring a new garden and having to go out and design it. And that was good because it gave me lots of different situations. Um, in my diploma portfolio, the designs, you know, one of them is called Steep Garden, which should have been called Steep North Facing <laughs> Garden <laughs> with a bog at the bottom. And then there was the Cottage Garden, which was all gravel and we had to pickaxe our way in and that kind of thing. So it gave me a lot, a lot of different situations to apply permaculture to. But that, of course, I was still thinking about gardening and permaculture is often mistaken as just a kind of organic gardening, whereas um, it started off being this um, thing that two Australian guys, Bill Mollison and David Honger, and they, um, it, during the 1970s of the oil crisis, OPEC oil crisis, they started looking at the fragility of our current system, the vulnerabilities we have, because whereas our ancestors used to walk around the landscape maybe run sometimes and climb a bit and swim a bit but they would move through the landscape to the places where things were you know to go get water to go find food and so on and we've come to a place now where we've basically stopped moving we decided at some point that we are going to settle and we're going to stay in one place and we're going to farm and there's a trade-off there you know there's a lovely quote at the, the end of Neil Oliver's Ancient History of Britain or whatever it's called on BBC4 and he says something along the lines of you know we the ancient Britons started to appreciate that they'd you know made their bed and had to lie in it and then to some degree so do we you know we are stuck in this situation that was set up for us by our ancestors who said we're going to stay in one place and now we all live in one place except a few people who try and move around and we persecute them and keep pushing them away <laughs> <Poor old gypsies. laughs> they're the last people trying to you know and there is this sense of you know we still commute to work we still have this sense of i need to move although these days we just let fossil fuels do the moving for us but we still make those journeys and there's something in our psyche that still sees ourselves as nomads but we're trapped in this this is your yeah. bit uh, if you're lucky to have a bit not everybody is lucky enough to have yeah. a bit and very often the people who travel still were the people who were <laughs> not lucky enough to have a bit because during the highland clearances and the um the what's the enclosures movement solution oh, of the right, commons yeah. the enclosures that's right yes that um they essentially didn't have enough to enclose and so they traded that off in order for, you know and became traveling agricultural workers and so on so um and of course during that time there was work for them but now there's less of that as well because we're kind of fixing our places and we have our jobs and agriculture has been very heavily mechanized so so it's interesting that with permaculture what we're trying to do is to essentially say what does nature do but one of the things that nature does which is move is something we don't do anymore and we we're trying to stop everything else moving as well and that's a huge amount of work what, you know what do you, you take what a, do you mean sorry, by uh, yeah. nature moves do you mean do you mean changing do you mean the uh, ever yeah everything's so you know the most obvious things that move are animals and birds and insects and so on because we see those because they're quite fast mm. and it's there's this um kind of cascade in nature that you notice the things that are fast or as fast as you or faster because they're the things that might catch you or eat you um so the you know the fastest um, brains in the animal world that we know of are the killer flies, and they they have to be fast enough to anticipate and be faster than the flies that they kill. And flies are very fast yeah. anyway because that's why we find it so hard to swat them. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so uh, so we only really notice that we don't feel threatened by a tree because we can run away from a tree and we can run away from a tortoise and a slug and so on but things that move a bit more quickly and vehicles of course in the modern world are things that could kill us and maybe run us over and eat us and so on so they're the things that we notice and they're the things that seem to move but if we spend enough time so one of the um core principle one one of the core practices of nature observation is the sit spot so you sit in one place for at least 20 minutes and you just see what happens so you go into a place of stillness and the animals start to the animals that have a bit freaked out because we move so quickly and we are potentially threatening start to see us as oh they're settled in the space and then they start to go back to what's called baseline so birds have this thing called baseline where they start to you know, go about their day again as long as we stay in one place so we see things that we wouldn't normally see and and so 
a lot of what what's going on in nature might be working at a different pace but you know trees trees move they make seed uh, well plants all plants make seed and the seed is how plants and trees move it's just a slower process than it is for us so so everything moves and everything moves in order to stay in the place that it wants to be so if you're a raspberry plant i don't know if you have yeah, raspberries I certainly do yes. <laughs> you probably do <laughs> so raspberries have this tendency to move so you put them on one side of the garden and then you turn around th- five years later and they're kind of halfway across the lawn or something like <laughs> that. Or well, we keep fighting them. Yes, indeed, they do that, don't they? And um, we just want to s- stay there because that's where we want to put you. You know, we're quite happy with the raspberries over there because that's our design and our intent. Um, but the raspberries don't want to stay there because in their world, if they don't move, they get buried under the shade of trees who are further back. So the trees are moving, they're seeding out into the open, and then small trees have to seed, or if they're something like blackthorn, they make, you know, send up um, mm-hmm. runners, not runners, what's the word? Su- uh, suckers, is it? Suckers. No, the, the things that, things that <laughs> shoot up out close. of the ground, you mean, that follows the root. Yeah, they come out, out of yeah. the ground. And brambles, of course, do that, yeah. and then land, and then yeah. layer. And uh, strawberries do that as well, and raspberries move, and they all move because they're trying to stay in their ideal spot with the things that are bigger behind them that they're trying to stay out of their shade, and basically trying to get into the place in front so that everything in front of them moves as well. So life yeah. moves, and and we observe this thing that we call succession in permaculture, and what that means is that if you stay in one place things change you start with your pioneer plants and they're followed by your herbaceous weeds very often they're quite prickly and thorny and they're very good at fixing you know repairing soils and then you have small shrubs and then small trees and then suddenly you're in a you know 60 80 years later you're in a beech wood or something like that or an oak forest so but if you are one of those things if you are a raspberry and you have the ability to sense the world around you, you are always in the same place. So you move physically in order to stay in the same relationship with the things either side of you. And so things move in order to stay in the best place for them, to have the right amount of light or the right food or whatever it is, because the plant world moves in order to do that. And so the animal world has to move in order to stay with that, yeah. if that makes sense. Uh, and then there's this intimate relationship of between the animal world and the plant world that the plants make the they can do photosynthesis and make sugars using the energy of the sun which we can't do and fungi can't do so we we all rely on that but we provide the services of um, seed dispersal and taking nutrients from one place to another and water and so on we drink something here we go and pee over here so we move stuff around and we do it without even thinking we're just going about our lives doing this and doing that and as long as we are living naturally which is what we can't do anymore because we're stuck in one place we would be doing exactly what everything else in nature needs so the challenge for permaculture is how do we mimic that and work with the energies of nature when we're in complete disconnect with one of the primary things that nature does which is to move so and that's where (laughs) that's why we're in a mess and also why permaculture still has a challenge in order to meet those needs because everything is always changing we're we're familiar with the economic system uh, constantly changing you know the interest rates and the availability of this and the price of shiitake mushrooms you know that's you might hey suddenly we we go from hey we can sell shiitake mushrooms grown on logs in our forest for 20 pounds a kilo in london and then other people start saying hey that's a good idea and they start growing as well and then the price goes down so then we have to reassess that and that's just Mm -hmm. life isn't it that um as things change and people see opportunities nature is always about where are the opportunities how can we take advantage of those and then there's this beautiful dance that's always going on so i don't know how i got there but (laughs) that's yeah (laughs) that's kind of what permaculture is trying to do and why why it's quite it a challenge indeed. really so what would you i mean you, you've kind of described a little bit about what permaculture is is about um you know could could you put a, a definition on that could you um sort of nail it down to a few phrases 
I think you, yes, you could say something along the lines of it's designing to meet our human needs in a way that works with nature as best we can in the circumstances and creates a surplus for reinvestment into the system because nature is always creating a surplus that goes back into the system. We have this input of sun um, and that increases the mass, the biomass of life on Earth mm -hmm. over time. So um, and one of the things I love about permaculture, uh, I did a permaculture design course with Patrick Whitefield uh, back in back oh, last yes. century <laughs> in in May of 1999. <laughs> and uh, that, that okay. was fantastic. What, what, what I love about permaculture is that it's 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 purpose driven. It's it's very goal orientated. So it's yes. deliberate. You design it. Um, and and it's also a rational system of sort of gathering knowledge, isn't it? You, you as you say, you mm. you look around from a sit spot or whatever. I mean, I remember, you know, one of the things is that is that you you don't do anything on a new piece of ground for for a full turn of the seasons, a full year, to yeah. to see just just to observe and to to take it all in. And it mm. it seems such a, a rational system of gathering knowledge to to know how to best interact with with the land you know with the earth in a broader sense but with the land in terms of your garden or your small holding and yeah. and, and it's fantastic so what, what would what would you consider to be the sort of overall goal of permaculture do you see it as a as a way of of living or some people call it a a, a means of solving problems how do you see it Oh, that's a good question. I suppose for me, it comes back to the difference between permaculture and permaculture design. So we look around at nature and we're surrounded by permacultures, things that are in beautiful symbiotic relationships, these mutualisms of things supporting each other, where the system as a whole grows in wealth, mm -hmm. if you like. And so for me, we could like the the proverbial monkeys with typewriters you know enough monkeys with enough typewriters eventually you'll get Shakespeare and to some degree we could also do permaculture like that but it's much better to as you say work with the information that you can gather around you um, the other designers you know people who have already done things in different places and look at how those relate to where we are um, and to use a design process so for me the design process is about helping us to do permaculture better and more quickly and um, it's yes it's interesting this um, the difference between people's definitions of permaculture because there's always the thing about context as well and the importance of observing where we are is that we unless we know where we are we don't know what we can another, do here. another thing i love about permaculture is that it is totally context orientated and um, one of the things yes. i always bang on about is how important context is in everything in all our thinking and every realm of life really but permaculture as you say context because you have to observe the land you have to it depends which way you you, you face whether it's south or north or east the, yeah. these the topography that you know the is their water source so many things so it is entirely contextual it's brilliant yes and the the and that's one of the key things to learn and i don't know that people always get that immediately they they understand that there's an observation phase but also if you open a permaculture book a lot of permaculture books are full of techniques and that's great because they're in this place you know step holzer is a classic example of a guy who's basically creating a vast bounty on the side of a mountainside <laughs> where he has no right to be doing so in most people's eyes and he has various different things that he does you, you, and one of his things is you mean, the, you mean all the, the you mean the, all the odds are stacked against him in that particular environment yeah. yes absolutely yes or at least that would be the general perception of the people that live around him where most people are just putting coniferous woodland on these slopes you know at four thousand feet um, steep slopes and so on and one of his practices that he uses is the German mound bed the Hugel Kultur which is being you know that he's um, rejuvenated I suppose or just you know it's been around for a while but he uses it and people have got very excited about that and the the danger really is that that people coming into permaculture might look around and say hey there's compost toilets and there's Hugel beds and there's wind power and there's XYZ you know solar hot water and these are things I just take them and I put them in my garden or I put them in my system and that makes it permaculture. Whereas permaculture is about, you know, what's what is the problem that he's solving by creating that hugel bed? What are his problems? Is it relating to temperature or sunshine or, you know, is it to do with humidity or whatever mm -hmm. it is, dryness of soil, regularity of rainfall? And 
how is that thing solving his problems? And do I have the same problems where I am? And that's the key thing is that that might work very well for me, but do I have the same problems? Do I have the same outcomes as he does? And if I don't, then this is not the the answer. It's a it's the tool for the job kind yeah. of situation. Pick the right tool out of the so, toolbox. Yeah. That's right. There's no point trying to knock a nail in with the handle of a screwdriver. <laughs> you know, you need the right tool. And some of the the learning of permaculture is you learn the tools and then you learn where the best places to apply them are. And that just takes, you've literally got to go up, get on and do things. And and so, yeah, so sometimes we might go places or somebody will say, uh, you know, there's chaps like Peter Harper, who's quite a critic of permaculture. But I think, and that's fine in the sense that it's all about their perception of things. I'm not saying he's wrong, but I'm saying that what he's seen obviously has not impressed him. And essentially permaculture, one of the, the defaults of permaculture is that it has to produce a surplus and it has to work. If it's not working, then it's not permaculture. It might be somebody trying to do permaculture, but it doesn't mean that because they're trying to do it, that it works yet. You know, part of that process, as you say, there's the observation and then we do things and then we observe how well it worked. And if it didn't work, then we go back and we try something else. And um, and that's just feedback. That's how systems work. So the, inevitably, there will be situations where people will look at something that somebody's calling permaculture and saying that's not very good. But it's and inevitably, there will be areas that are like that. But there are also plenty of fantastic examples of permaculture, which are really mm. exceptional. And I would always point people to those and say, that's the permaculture. And the problem with permaculture is that you can't just see permaculture because permaculture is about relationships. So it's very easy to see things. It's easy for me to go into my garden and see different kinds of fruit bushes and the birds that come in and some insects and so on. But it, I would have to sit and spend a lot of time observing them, their movements and how they interact with each other to understand the relationships. And it's how nature puts things together. It's how we put things together that create those mutual sure. benefits. And so permaculture is, is kind of really under the surface. And it takes time you know, to do that observation and to really understand what's happening in order to work with those flows rather than against them. So, you know, and a seemingly obvious one is water flows downhill <laughs> and warm air rises and yet still we find situations where people put things together back to front so oh we need a pump to pump the water uphill and while all the time we have fossil fuels and cheap electricity and so we don't think too much about that but that's not always going to be the case i don't think so yeah, it's good um, permaculture is about yeah setting things up so that they're we might put an investment of time and energy into something, but that that it looks after itself and it produces a surplus mm. and it's very... You know. one, one of the things I love about permaculture is that um, it, 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 it learns best from observing nature. And I think we forget that what we observe around us in nature is the result of millions of years of effectively research and development. <laughs> Absolutely. because it's what works yeah. so so what is as we look around the landscape is, is what has worked and, and the plants that grow together in certain areas are there because you know it works it's been tried you know ever since <laughs> so so I, lo I love the fact yeah. that it's it observes the natural systems that work and as you say these interrelationships but I think that can that that has the effect of as you said earlier a lot of people tend to view it as just it's about gardening and growing things maybe mm -hmm. I mean we yeah. should point out here I suppose that permaculture is two words it's the merging of permanent and agriculture yes. so so there we get yeah. permanent permanent agriculture permaculture and inevitably the most important thing we humans must do is 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 figure out how we're going to live on the land as you now that we're sort of mm. domesticated in one space and and we need to know how to produce food that's a basic one we need to know how we're going to yeah. source our water and 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 it seems permaculture seems to me to be such a great way of thinking deliberately about all the aspects of, of our lives i mean to me i i see it as a, as a map for life 
with this problem solving mm. approach and, and and I would try and encourage everyone to, to, to pr try and zoom out a little bit from the gardening aspect because because it, you can I mean you, you, you I mean no doubt you can give us some examples but there are lots of things you can do in your own even small garden um, I, I use a, I have a three acre small holding and so obviously your canvas yeah. is a little larger and, and, and permaculture projects are, are huge aren't they some of them some of the ones you hear about Jeff Lawton speaking about yeah. But um, perhaps you could describe to us a few ways in which, you know, the ordinary person in a house with a small garden might be able to benefit from, from permaculture. How can we engage them and, and uh, show them how it might benefit them? Um, well, I suppose coming back to the gardening thing, you know, it's in a sense, we are not only are we staying in one place, we're also very disconnected from life skills. You know, we go to school and we're taught a bunch of stuff, which really is about preparing us to work in industry you know to work in a factory or work in science or something wherever it is but we're channeled into these kind of pathways but something i never learned at school was how to grow my own food or how to clean water or build my own home any of those things because when you have those things then you don't have you're not so much reliant on the society around you and whereas our ancestors lived in small groups and those skills were amongst inevitably within the, the tribe or the community because they had to be, you know, you had to have those things. But now we live in a world of consumerism where essentially we're being sold things. And the reason we're being sold those things is because we have this weird money system which runs on interest, which means that you're always chasing paying off the interest by borrowing more money from the future, which means that we have to do more and more work or produce more and more goods. So they become shonkier and shonkier and they break more quickly. And that is all about disconnecting us. You know, if, if we could do those things, then we're not good consumers. We don't provide to the economy. And we're, we live in this crazy world where that, a, you know, a terrible oil spill is good for the economy. So people celebrate it, you know. So, but coming back to, you know, what can we do in our gardens? We have a small garden here and we've stacked in so many things we've got three grapevines and an apricot tree and a juneberry and there's lots of soft fruit and so on and for me it's very exciting this time of year because everything comes out of the ground with mostly perennial gardening because i spend very often i'll be two weeks away from home teaching so it's more difficult for us my partner's also away sometimes to do annual vegetables um so we're very much a kind of forest garden situation and um but the gardening side of things you know for me gardening gives us so much but it gets us out in the open air it gets you start to become better observers because you start to think hang on i put that there yesterday and it's gone or who's thrown that mulch everywhere out of the pot <laughs> and then you spend more time it's ah oh, it's the blackbirds and uh, and then maybe you hear the back start to hear the blackbirds singing in the morning it's like oh the blackbirds are out so look out for that mulch so you start to make these connections and um so there's getting out in the sunshine, there's learning about nature, there's growing our own food, there's fresh air, there's fitness and so on and so forth. So gardening gives us so much and it begins to make us better at asking questions as well. So we're, we start to get more curious about things and then, and then there's the empowerment that comes from, hey, I grew that. <laughs> and there's, you know, to go out into the garden and harvest food and eat it. You know, not only do we know where it's come from and how well the soil's been looked after and you know there's no pesticides or any of that stuff on it, but you also know that that was you, that you were a part of that process. You know, you're not entirely responsible. The plant grew itself and it used the sunshine and the water and so on, but I was a part of that process. I took the seeds and I moved and I placed, you know, I, I cared for the thing that grew that then gave mm. me some food. And... And that's such a hugely empowering, enjoyable, you know, for me, there's nothing really close Absolutely. to that. The excitement of food appearing and <laughs> the satisfaction <laughs> and then the chance to share that as yeah. well. That sense yeah. of, of personal accomplishment. I, I think that, that's, uh, you know, that's an important part of it because, I mean, human beings, we're, we're the only species who have that power to change our surroundings to suit our, ourselves, aren't we? I mean, mm -hmm animals and plants yeah. uh, if the environment is is suited they will survive and if it isn't they perish whereas we we have that ability to to design 
through things like permaculture, um, or not through things like but through permaculture, we have the ability to design our, our surroundings in, in a sensible way that, that supports life, that supports, as you mentioned, uh, there's always production, there's a production of a surplus with, with permaculture. Yeah. It's an inherently productive um, philosophy, isn't it? It's, um, it's, it's very, very much about providing food and uh, and harnessing energy in in a in an ongoing yeah. sustainable way would you agree yes it's very much an abundance thing and people often you know they'll look at you know these things and think oh that's austerity you know you have to go without in order to live like that and for me it's you know somebody came up a few years ago a friend of mine said you know it's permaculture is inviting people to a better party to say you know it's maybe you're a bit bored of the alcohol and the late nights and all that stuff and now and there's permaculture and and so on a permaculture course i think for me it's a celebration of there's all of these amazing things that we can do and i'm so excited you know i'm 20 years on after doing my pd well more than 20 years i have a pile of books <laughs> on my bookshelf here um some of which i've had time to read many of which i haven't all of these different avenues, because when you teach a permaculture design course, you're going into, you know, buildings and energy and water and soil and economic systems and all mm. of these things. And there's so many people doing amazing things in all of these realms. And just to, I feel like I'm, you know, one of these kind of taster buffets where I'm tasting a bit of that and a bit of that. And I like it all. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And hey, I've still got the rest of my life to yeah. carry on learning this stuff. It's interesting um, that you say, um, by, sorry to interrupt yeah. you, but it's interesting that you say, who was it who said that permaculture is austerity? Because to me, I see it as abundance. I mean, when, you, when you've got, you know, multiple layers of, of uh, food producing plants, um, you know, designed to be as effortless to harvest and, 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 and placement of things for convenience, all these simple things. It, it seems to me to be something very much a, about abundance and plenty, plenty rather than austerity. So um, who is it? Who, is that is that a, yeah. a mainstream critic? Well, it's, I think it's just more of a general perception that people have this right. assumption that in order to live closer to nature or that you have to give right. things up. And I think to some degree, you know, if we're if we're using things from the techno industrial system, like the computer that we're talking on at the moment, then inevitably that involves money because those systems use money. So and they use a particular kind of money, which is causing a lot of damage. So permaculture isn't let's not use those things because they're there and they're good methods of communication. But actually, let, let's not get lost in them like the the. Uh, you know, the epitome of standing and looking at your phone all day <laughs> and when people get lost in that when they're surrounded by all this amazing stuff you know and we live in a landscape where there are at least i suppose some of the people get out into the landscape but then they're shooting pheasants you know they breed pheasants to shoot around here and i look at these birds as they're and they're not very smart but then they didn't co-evolve with cars <laughs> <laughs> so so they do get hit by cars because they go oh let's go across there yeah. to but um, but then the you know the people they're outside in the countryside and they're still basically they stick the you know we've got these these on but they've got ear defenders on because they're shooting these loud guns and um, and the best thing they can come up with to do with this astonishing piece of biotechnical engineering that is a living thing is to use it for target practice and I just think what is going on in their heads this is. <laughs> It's it's an incredibly beautiful thing, and you know you could look at it in the system and say, well, it doesn't belong here because it's from Asia and somebody's brought them over here. But they are beautiful, um, but we have the consequences of things that come from one place to another. And I guess what we do as human beings is we move things much more quickly than they would naturally because obviously things do travel, um, you know, by water and by air and so on. But we humans have the ability to move things more quickly and create a bigger yeah. imbalance, which nature has Sometimes to Sometimes to our detriment, yeah, with moving uh, American grey yeah. squirrels, for example, is the first one that comes, oh, yeah. um, pushing out the English red squirrels, for example, and there's a whole, I think monk jack deer came from China or something, didn't they? And yeah, that's right, they were mm. introduced. But there's very, I mean, the squirrel thing is, um, 
very exciting because the pine martins have been reintroduced into Scotland and they're coming down towards the border and into northern England. And uh, what they've identified by studying the pine martins, the pine martin is the natural predator of the red squirrel. And you would think, oh, so red squirrels are competing with greys and they've got to now cope, cope with pine martins yeah, <laughs> who, will, who will like to eat them, you see. But it turns out that the and this is the nature of systems and why we spend time observing and just don't make assumptions is that the pine martins are actually helping the red squirrels because the gray squirrels are bigger and they're easier to catch because they're heavier they can't go as far out onto the branches the reds go all the way to the tips of the branches of the trees and they can leap yeah. across free um, and the pine martins are small and they can do that but the, the grays are too ah, heavy so yeah. they so basically the greys are moving out of the areas where there are pine martins because of the predation and the reds are then being left so they're not having to compete with the greys anymore oh, and so, so the, reds, the red numbers are going mm. up in line with the increase in the pine martins yeah. and you'd think that doesn't make any sense and it's amazing. So, Question assumptions. So there are good things. <laughs> yes. you see, there's another <laughs> another thing I love about it because you know the theme of this show is about questioning assumptions and people tend to assume that life entails you know leaving school or university and going to a job and living in a box and having a tiny garden uh, and and the all of these assumptions need questioning you know life needs redesigning i think on many levels and and i i like the way uh, you know as you just pointed out perm permaculture doesn't assume anything uh, we, we 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 sit back we observe for a full set of seasons and 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 work with what is I mean, that's such a powerful principle yeah. you know we're not trying to, to necessarily force things which uh, you never see in nature we're, we're, we're working with natural systems and, and 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 you know again not making assumptions which which is I love about it <laughs> perhaps I can um, ask you to um, help me out with a definition for for sustainable because this is I think one issue the word sustainable seems to have been sort of hijacked, doesn't it? It's a, it's a great word. Yeah, it's a bit absolutely. like the word natural. Um, <laughs> put the word natural on a product and, 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 and it, oh, it's great. <laughs> Sustain it. It's natural. <laughs> yeah. It? I mean, you could argue that everything on planet Earth is natural to planet Earth, you know, bar perhaps a meteorite coming in. But but it's become a bit of a meaningless term, isn't it? Sustainable. I mean, sustainable yeah, in, in, so it, in its in its rawest form seems to mean you can keep on doing it. Now you could say that about anything, yeah. whether it be something polluting or something something good. So so how would you sort of define sustainable as it should be used? You know, in 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 a, in, in the context of permaculture. Well, I think uh, you know, nature, life on Earth has sustained itself since life appeared three and a half billion years ago um but it's a funny word isn't it because you know it's a lot of corporations like mcdonald's would talk about strategies and say this makes us sustainable and that doesn't make the things that they're doing it doesn't make the world around them sustainable it just sustains the thing that they're doing by selling those things to people who will eat <laughs> that those is things. the classic uh, yeah, yeah the classic confusion isn't it it makes it makes the the company look good by using that word where where all they actually mean is mm -hmm. we're going to keep on doing what we're doing <laughs> <laughs> yeah what are we trying to sustain is the question yes. and this is why i like um words like regenerative and restorative because they're talking about because we don't really want to st sustain things if it's bad we don't want to sustain bad no. <laughs> that's not if we've got good already, we want to, you know, hang on to that. Um, but regenerative infers that we're taking something that's been damaged and we're putting it back to into a better place. Um, and there's also, you know, a, there was a joke that some comedian made at one point about how you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't describe your relationship or your marriage as sustainable. <laughs> that <wouldn't... laughs> so, that's not really the kind of word that you would say, oh, it's going well. Yeah, it's a bit like it? tolerable, so, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> slightly above tolerable maybe yeah, who knows <laughs> so yeah so um, yes I much prefer words like regenerative restorative that yeah. kind of thing because you know. you know the thing that that obviously I suppose is trying to be sustained with with the original spirit behind the use of that word um, was was that obviously humanity can 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 carry on and uh, uncompromised in terms of using resources and I think this is it's kind of 
again it's just such a rational approach when I consider my small holding and I've got areas of woodland and and you know areas of pasture and this this and that I, I obviously if, if I'm using something as a fuel supply or, or as, a, as a source of energy it, it's obviously in my interest that, that, that I'm I continue to be able to do that so you know you, you wouldn't you wouldn't go and um, whatever resource you've got you wouldn't want to go and just use it all up without you know zooming out taking note of the context and 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 designing a system that's going to maybe use that at a in a, at a modest way or, or design something else entirely yes it's, yes this is you know what life does is it interrupts the flow of energy and resources through the landscape so plants interrupt sunlight and you know, and water and um, and some degree the you know the carbon dioxide in the air and so on and then and animals have to move around and interrupt the things that they eat and so on so one of the things that permaculture focuses on is this building of stocks you know one of David Holmgren's principles is catch and store energy and that's to do with um, where the storage is on within your control I suppose within your landscape so for you you have wood and you have soil and you have pasture and plants and so on and those are things that are not just accessible to you that they're within your realm and many of us live lives where there is a stock of water but it's in a reservoir and it's 100 miles away and it's we have no direct access to it or control over the tap you know we have a tap in our house but there's another tap further down the line which if that gets turned off the tap in our house does absolutely nothing in the same way that you know we could go to tesco's or any other supermarket and there seems to be an abundance of food there but it's not within our reach you know if tesco's doesn't have food it's because actually it's been grown <laughs> hundreds thousands maybe tens of thousands of miles away and we don't have access to that directly either most of us don't have access to the things that we need the energy and the food and the water because they've been taken away from us to the point where then we have to basically behave ourselves you know do what we're supposed to do in order to be given access to those things and to take back control of those things say well hang on a sec the rain that falls out of the skies what fills the reservoir but it also falls on me and i could collect that off my roof and i can use it to help grow food in my garden in fact if i improve my soils water holding capacity then i don't need to hold it so much off the roof because then the plants have it directly yeah. and so suddenly i've got food i've got water which i you know and we can make simple filtration systems who need to clean the water up for drinking and so on and you know we can um, create copy systems to start harvesting for wood and so on and as long as we're not taking out of those stocks any more than we're putting in over a period of time obviously there are times where in the winter we need more wood <laughs> um, and in the summer is when it grows and that's the nature of nature is that life stores things for periods of shortage you know we you know squirrels bury nuts or bears get fat or whatever it is in order to go from a period of abundance to less stuff and then back to abundance again and so so for me permaculture is also about connecting back to creating those stocks and they for all we might not all have room for this stuff in our garden but we can connect to local food growers in our community and people that are doing those things and we don't all have to learn how to grow food although you know for me it's such an amazing thing to do but um we've gone from a place where 60 percent of us i believe used to work on the land before the industrial revolution if you go back to you know when we went to Matic, we were all basically pretty much going out and getting food and now about one percent of us work on the land and most of those people are stuck in boxes in machines that are disconnected from the land anyway so so i think permaculture for me is is in many ways it's about reconnecting us with our inheritance of our, the knowledge of how to grow food and save seed um, and just understand what's going on around us and work with those mm. systems um, and reconnect with each other as well around this common purpose rather than us have to have discussions about you know who was whatever on Strictly Come Dancing or whatever it is last <laughs> night <laughs> like, which to me just to me is one of those massive distractions and i can't say that people you know obviously people enjoy that stuff mm -hmm. and that's fine but we're so we've been made so comfortable in uh given the illusion of comfort 
I suppose, because that could all of this stuff could just disappear tomorrow, and and then all we have is what we understand. And which so, is very little for most people. <laughs> which is very little, and this is the horror of it, because then those people, you know, they're going to suffer or they're going to go mad and they <laughs> run around beating people up, and who knows what would happen. So, for me, this kind of permaculture and transition is also about how do we. Ma- go through a process of change and creating more resilience in our landscape both personally and in the community level and maybe at bio-regional level um and this you know Tartness has become whilst it's one of those places that has um, quite a lot of wealth and that kind of thing going on if you go to Tartness high street it's a mixture of kind of posh haute couture shops and things and then there's all the kind of slightly what we might call hippie stuff but of course <laughs> i don't really associate with the word hippie but that uh, but if you take a tour with hal who does the transition tours you know you see all kinds of amazing things going on the reconomy center they do a kind of dragon's den but with the people mm-hmm. of the town offering different things from money to um, you know i'll make you a meal or I'll look after your kids once a week or whatever to people setting up businesses like community supported agriculture and so on there's a they did a looking at um, feeding totness from the local area and they identified one thing that they didn't have was grains nobody really was growing grains so they set up a grain growing business to grow and to process those grains locally and that's a cooperative doing that so there's all of these amazing projects which uh, just give me hope that because people are having to do these things to find out if they work or not and so on and to some degree they're still tied into that kind of bigger money economy but it is starting to create some resilience at a wider level and give us an opportunity to start rethinking you know as you say start questioning how things are is it really wise for us to have a car and drive around so much and spend you know buy the latest phone every time it comes out is that a wise investment or am i better off learning permaculture, finding out about the wild foods that grow where I live. Um, because for me, that's, if we look at wealth, there's a chap called Ethan Rowland. I don't know if you come across him. Uh, he's one of um, somebody who, who, along with somebody else, came up with um, eight forms of capital. And if you look online, there's several different versions of, you know, seven or eight forms of wealth and so on. Uh, he called it capital. For me, I kind of prefer the idea of wealth because that infers a flow as well as a stock because obviously real wealth is in the flow because stocks deteriorate and they leak and they mm-hmm. so on you know they they're attractive things steal them <laughs> whereas a flow um, there's real wealth in that so but he's you know says that financial wealth is only one type of wealth that you have there's you know your kind of intellectual wealth there's your experiential wealth there's your health physical health and we have social and cultural wealth both of you know social is who we know cultural is the stories the things the knowledge passed on to us by our yeah. ancestors and and all of these that's things that's a wonderful insight that, sorry to interrupt you that's a wonderful insight to yeah. look at wealth in all these different ways i like that yeah so we're not just saying how much money have i got in the bank so for me no i <laughs> if somebody came to me and said well how is your pension plan i just look at them and say mm, well financially it's not very good but i think from lots of other perspective i'm doing all right because well, i've got a lot of yeah connections. you know what i mean i think lots to a certain people, extent yeah. your pension plan can be designed into the landscape because because just tying back to something you said a while yeah. ago um you know the the um uh what was it i've lost my thread now the um ah Edit break. <laughs> that's that's age. That is. <laughs> Quick edit break, and I'll pick up my thread. Um, where was I going with that? Um, the the, we- the wealth one? being yes. designed in, into the landscape because it's security. So yes. w- one yeah. of the things that that, that that strikes me about permaculture is is that it offers security to to almost anyone. Whether you're growing food in a in a small flat, uh, you know, on a, on a, or a terrace garden, up in a, a roof garden, even 
even that affords you some food security and, and at the other end of the extreme you know you, you may have a farm of, of, of you know 10 20 100 acres or something but obviously much more food security but but this security uh, is something that we have little of these days as you mentioned you know the the, the economic future is uncertain to put it mildly and and I think that to, to the extent that we design into our very landscape um, you know, uh, provision of, of, of food, uh, of energy materials, growing a wood so that you can, you know, use a f fire to keep yourself warm. All of these things are, are really important for as single strands of a, of a web of security. Yes. The, the other thing I yes. love about permaculture, which I'm sure you, you, you experience too, is is this connection with the land. When you're, when you're more... Um, when you when you're using the land as a canvas on which to paint if you like to to to, mm. to you know it might be digging ponds it might be planting orchards uh, all of these things um, it, there's so much reward and that ties in with that wealth thing you know the, the, yeah. the pleasure you get from watching a tree grow I mean I've planted trees mm -hmm. 30 years ago and you look at this and you think oh I remember planting that <laughs> it just it, it really gets it's a really <laughs> a joyful thing isn't it it is yeah the great, I was, the grapevines outside here you know when we planted them they were like maybe 18 inches long little stubby things and then i remember you know after one year it grows and you've got to cut it right down again i was thinking oh. <laughs> but uh, and now they're all over the pergola and across the wall and they produce loads of grapes every year and and that's um and it's interesting because then that becomes an investment in your place. It makes us less likely to feel like Absolutely. moving. And we do live in a very transient sense of world. Place, but, sense you know, of place is, is something that yeah. most people don't have. Because I think in the average new build modern house on a housing estate, which it, which usually yeah. just looks like it's landed in the middle of a field, some lucky farmer has, has, has cashed in. All of a sudden the land, a housing estate arrives and, and there is no sense of place there. There's there. It's... It, very very much a lost concept it really doesn't match no i mean poundbury being a perfect example up in dorchester it's uh, it's just like a whole pile of lego bricks that have been dumped on top of and in the style of older houses but they look new with laser cut edges and so on and it just doesn't make any sense and the our ancestors had to work with what they had you know we the cottage we live in here was originally uh a barn for animals in 1860 when it was originally built and that whole original part of the house is 80 is uh, made of flint and lime mortar and you go out in the land and you dig a hole and you find flint you literally dug it out of the ground and built with it because yeah. that's what they had and um in a lot of the houses are thatched here because if you got the valley there's reeds and that's what you have you don't have slate and you don't have tiles but you have reeds so that's what you use and and so those houses fit into the landscape because they're made yeah. of the land and when you see something like Poundbury or these new bills they don't sit because they don't look like anything in the landscape and and this is the thing is we're using energy you know it's in the past our ancestors if they wanted to make a statement about how powerful they were they would basically move stuff <laughs> so Stonehenge is so obviously doesn't fit in the landscape Although for our modern eyes, it's, you know, we look at it and say, how, oh, wow, is that's amazing. But if you look at what's in the ground, you say, well, that didn't come from here. And so then that's a statement of power because I, we had the power to take that from all the way over there in Wales and put it here, you know, and the, and the pyramids at Giza, you know, those things are astonishing. And so, but for most of most people, they had to work with what they had, which was the energy that they had around them. And, and essentially, if we're not doing that, then we're living on you know we are literally living on the energy of the past the fossil fuels that were made by the plankton that fell to the sea floor 150 million years ago to make oil and gas and the all those trees that went down before fungi so between the period of where plants developed lignin to become taller the, to make wood to get higher up so they were less easy to be eaten by many of the dinosaurs i guess at the time and the cycads and so on and then there were 60 million years of that, the Carboniferous period, where trees were falling and nothing could eat the wood. <laughs> they just kind of collapsed and got buried. And then over all of the last 300 million years, that's all got buried by geology and compressed into coal, which we then been digging up. But that was 300 million years ago. And they're stocks that we'll be using up 
but and using stocks is okay if they're filling up again but those things are not filling up you know coal will never be made again oil and coal uh, oil and gas are being made but at an incredibly slow rate so we're we're living beyond our means i suppose and permaculture tries to reconnect us back to you know what is what is the real carrying capacity of the land here if we ignore that because i don't have the technology to go get oil and gas out of the ground so again by using that i am slave enslaving myself to the system that basically buy you know sells me those things i have no control over that energy and so if i become reliant upon it then i become enslaved to that system whereas if i can you know permaculture is not about self-sufficiency it's always been about mutual uh, setting up mutually beneficial relationships so how can we find other people around us who are of like minds who can work and trade things and share you know life change life is trading stuff all the time there's nothing wrong with trading the problem is the system that we've developed for trading at the moment the money system that we use that's the thing that's doing the damage so so permaculture just tries to and i think this is why perhaps people get the idea that it's about austerity because if we stop using those things, then life gets a little bit harder from a physical perspective. We might have to do more work, but also, you know, permaculture, if you're applying permaculture widely, so there's the permaculture ethics, which we should mention, which are care of care of the earth, which is the overarching one, um, and then care of people, and also what's often been called fair shares and sharing surplus and so on. And these are all about, um, so permaculture often gets applied to kind of garden and fields at farm scale. So often you'll see permaculture on that kind of scale. But if you step back and say, what are the ethics? Well, earth care is about caring for the entire earth. That's the kind of biggest scale that we can really work with. And then people care is about the humanity scale, or we might call holons in systems thinking. And then fair share is all kind of community. That's a more of a community level, but you can also think of that as a larger scale. But what if we go back inwards? What about this thing we inhabit, the body? And everything that we do, or most of what we do in the world, is to look after this, either physically or emotionally, you know, the well-being and so on. So we change the landscape outside in order to care for this. But if we, we're starting to do things that aren't caring for this, you know, so things like glyphosate which is doing causing havoc you know with our bodies and the, the soil and so on yeah. then then we're essentially permaculture has to come back in and and look after this as well we need to think what is this thing designed for that i inhabit this space suit yeah. or whatever yeah. it is that i'm inhabiting right now what's where did it evolve what was it designed to do and how can i what do i need to do to look after it because if i don't do what it was designed to do then it will start breaking down and it won't work so well. And that includes the way we move and the way we use it, but also, of course, what we eat and what we drink and the kind of things. And it's, and it's difficult once the landscape is being poisoned, that essentially we just, you know, that's bad. But in order to look after this, we need to start filtering the things that we put into Absolutely. our bodies. And, and that's easier when we are in control yeah. of those things, when I can clean my own water and i can grow my own food and and so whilst it's not about self-sufficiency it's it is very much about trying to you know regain many of those skills and to create that in a, a kind of broader community mm. scale i, I almost <clears> yeah, it does sense. i almost prefer the word self-reliance from from uh, self-sufficiency yes a, a certain amount of independence but um, i mean essentially what you say about the ethics i mean I, I i have a slightly different take on that in that i think earth care um, comes after uh, people care in that I think the human beings are, are more important but with the proviso that they are rational because uh, rational people wouldn't wouldn't despoil their earth I mean I, I don't I, I, no. I manage my small holding and anybody would anybody you know you, you don't sort of poo on your own doorstep as it were you, you so, so so provided we are taking rational care of ourselves if we're really and permaculture is all about that it's about observing and learning and looking at what works and what doesn't and and when you can see that it doesn't work to just lay waste the forest and then okay well now we haven't got any more fuel where are we going to go now 
So, so I, I think when 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 human beings rationally take care of themselves, the earth naturally gets taken care of because because of the connection, because of the complete dependence. I mean, I you know, in a, in a sense, mm. well, ultimately, we are completely dependent on the earth and this environment we live in. I mean, it, it couldn't be any other way. So it, it's it is absolutely insane to to pollute the air with something that we know is toxic or spray glyphosate on crops that we know wrecks our gut lining and 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 and, and all this yeah. sort of stuff <clears throat> but um yeah yeah and, I, and and you know and, the, and that dependency is at all scales you know it's, it's one thing to say we rely on plants but we also rely on bacteria you know you talked about gut bacteria absolutely absolutely vital and then there's the bacteria in the soil that are able to take atmospheric nitrogen which is two nitrogen atoms bound very tightly together um completely unusable by us we breathe it in breathe it out plants can't use it the only thing that can break that bond are a few bacteria that produce an enzyme that shh, turn it into an ammonium compound that can then be used by bacteria to make nitrates and nitrites or by plants directly or just you know so depending on what kind of plant what kind of nitrogen you like and then it's in the system and Brilliant. that's the building blocks of proteins and amino acids and we are totally dependent on these tiny things we cannot even see without a microscope and so for us to you know as humanity to have this idea that we are the kind of the the peak of evolution and we are so important is doesn't make any sense because it's that not seeing and i guess what permaculture does for me is it helps us to appreciate all of those things going on around us once we start to notice these things we say oh my god we really do need to look after the mm. soil and we need to look after what we put in our guts and these things that we co you know co uh, co habit that cohabit mm. us um, essentially because if we don't then you know as you say ultimately it comes back on yeah. us if we don't look after that out there, it's coming back around. There's a lovely cartoon that I found for my uh, latest book, and it looks old enough to be out of copyright. <laughs> An old style, and there's a guy, you know, it's the world, and there's a very large man with a large cannon on the top of the world, and he's fired the cannon, and the ball is going all the way around the outside of the world, and it's just arriving behind <laughs> his head, you know, and he's and he's excited because he goes further than yeah, I yeah. think. <laughs> right, back to biting. It really epitomizes that everything comes back around. So whatever you put out comes mm. back. And that happens on so many levels, whether you're talking about your, the way we interact with our community and the people around us or what we do in relation to the, the earth as a whole. It's um, And, yes, so I think permaculture... Permaculture helps us to appreciate that, but also gives us tools to do something mm. about it. Well, on that note of mentioning mm. your book, um, perhaps you could give us some details. Uh, I believe it's called Permaculture Design, a step-by-step -step guide. Um, where people okay, can people get that? And, and perhaps you could let us know around how people might be able to contact you if they wanted to do a permaculture design course. You've mentioned that you're in Totnes in Devon, I believe. Um, so get... I live in Devon, but... I, I don't live in oh, Totnes. Sorry. <laughs> <But yeah. laughs> Please correct me. <laughs> well, I know it quite well, yes. Um, yeah, so, uh, well, the book was something I wrote, I don't know, I mean, it, it came out in 2012, but for a number of years before that, I was teaching weekend-based courses where there would be three weeks between over the winter. So in the summer months, I do two-week residentials. Uh, in the winter, it was, you know, one weekend and then a couple of weeks off and then another weekend and so on. And um, and we do we go through a design process. So essentially, part of the course is you know a chunk of the course is to do with plants and soil and water and how we look after all those things and buildings and so on. And then the other part of the course is to actually go through a process of design. So people usually do a garden, but it could be their house or their livelihood, whatever it is they want to design. And so um, and each week we have a, a different stage. So there's the observation stage. Um, so there's the site survey. There's the what's the the client remit and so on and and so then and then we move on to analysis and then we have to think about what we're going to choose and where we place things and so on and and so i um i was realizing that people were coming back and they kind of forgotten what i was <laughs> what they were supposed to have done or what was it from we did last weekend so i started making these worksheets um and they just ultimately evolved into this book and the idea of the book is that it's fairly portable. It's not really a beginner's book, but if you have a bit of understanding of permaculture, you've done maybe an introductory course or watched a couple of videos and you understand a little bit about the ethics and 
the principles and the zone, zoning and that kind of thing. Then it's really about how do those things fit together. Um, I saw it a little bit like having a jigsaw. So I, I found myself in a place where, um, particularly teaching something, you really have to learn learn it in order to communicate it and there were things that being a curious person I was just thinking so how does all this fit together and it, it was as if I was looking at a jigsaw my mum does jigsaws so I can see her sat at her table with all the pieces out in front of her and uh, and just trying to do so how does it fit together oh those things go together over there and that fits together and that oh hang on all of that fits together and and starting to make sense of you know where do these tools fit in the process how when do i use the ethics and when is zoning useful and when is random assembly useful and all of these kind of things and the book is about putting all of those things into the context of a process you know I, i'm here now i want to get to over there i've got some sense of what that looks like and so i know where i'm going but what are the things i can use along the way to help guide me and make decisions and so the book really is all about that mm-hmm. Um, and and is that available on uh, Amazon? Yeah. I, I believe it is. Is that right? It, it is the. I mean, the, the Amazon thing. <laughs> so Amazon, I I make about fifty pence on an Amazon sale, on you know. So the book sold for ten pounds or whatever. I get fifty pence about six months later. So if people buy. I've learned that if you buy directly from the author, you, the author is a lot sure, happier. And they get well, how can we do that? Reinvestment back into the system. So my website is called Learn Permaculture. So that's learnpermaculture.com. Um, there's, yes, I run courses. Um, for me, yes, I mean, one of the other great things about running permaculture courses is I continue to learn from the people that come because they all have particular backgrounds and skills and they want to add to those and I learn from them. And... I just build this huge, ever <laughs> expanding collection of people who are in my life that are doing amazing things. And then I'll meet them five years later and they're running a CSA somewhere or whatever it is. And it's just the joy Wonderful. of that for me. It's just uh, that it gives me hope because I am, I keep, you know, I surround myself in my life with people who are inspiring yeah. and lovely and, um, and so for me, that's one of the other great things about permaculture is when you come into permaculture, you're not just about learning tools and techniques, you're connecting to a network of amazing people. Wonderful so, stuff. Well, um, you, you mentioned uh, David Holmgren's um, principles of permaculture. Um, mm. I haven't, uh, I was just thinking about uh, sharing with the listeners some, some other uh, useful resources. Um, I can't remember um, Bill Mollison's book. I've got a copy of it somewhere. I did try and find it so that I could do it. <laughs> but unfortunately, it's, it's lost in my library somewhere. Um, do, do, you, do you know the names of either of those two books for, for the listeners? The David Holm, particularly for the principles. I think that's a, a very useful one because I know mm. David Holmgren, Holmgren did some uh, work in collating the ideas of Bill Mollison and, and getting these 12 principles sorted. He did, yes. Um, I... Yes, and I also would not say don't start with those okay, books. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so they're great books. They're kind of um, well, certainly the designers' manual is an amazing book. There's to some degree, it's a little bit chaotic in its layout. The but that's things the that, Bill Mollison book, yeah. Mm, that's the the designers' manual. He also wrote um, with David Holmgren. They wrote Permaculture One and then Permaculture Two and then Introduction to Permaculture, which kind of put those together. That's the smaller of. Bill Mollison's right. books really and that's the one that I would say if you were going to start with a Mollison book start with that one that's also the cheapest uh, the designer's manual is great it's um, but it's one of those books that you open it up and go oh my god this looks amazing and I haven't got time yeah. to read it um, David Holmgren's um, book from 2001 I think it was called permaculture principles and pathways beyond sustainability um, also an excellent book but very cerebral um so i really enjoyed it i think some people might find it difficult with the lack of pictures okay. um whereas he's now just produced a book called retro suburbia which i don't have a copy of yet because it's literally just out um but that appears to be absolutely chock full of beautiful okay. pictures <laughs> and that's all about Somebody's how do we <laughs> take our yeah <laughs> maybe and so uh, and that one appears to be about how do we take our, you know, a suburban landscapes, he's yeah. Australian, and repurpose them to be much better in terms of food production and so on and creating communities. So I think that's a real, that's one's really about for people who are applying those things at a personal level. Whereas I think the original book uh, or the previous book, 
was more uh, kind of manifesto for councils and governments to really get their act right. together and help yeah. you know so um, and yet the pump, those permaculture principles have lovely icons and they're quite memorable but I think if you go back to the basics of where the principles come from which ultimately is nature and people's interpretations of those but you'll find them through books like uh, Robert Couric's Designing and Maintaining Your Edible Landscape yeah. Naturally that's a non catchy title he had the golden rules of edible landscaping and uh, Bill Mollison had a few in his designer's manual um, but not the complete set if that makes sense and I think that's that people have just added over time, like any living system, it's evolved. So what's in Bill Mollison's book from 30 years ago, um, some people see it as the Bible, but to me, you know, <laughs> it's an old book and it's never mm. been revised. And lots of people have brought new things into permaculture yeah. since then. So it's it's and kind of a, a foundation yeah. stone, but it's not yeah. the whole thing anymore. So Wonderful. And what was um, the book you mentioned uh, at the beginning of the show? Was it is it uh, David Hart's book of forest gardening? That's a use. Robert, Robert Hart. Hart. Beg your pardon. Well, Robert Hart. He yes, he was the original for person who brought forest gardening to a cool, temperate yeah. climate. But if people want to know about forest gardens, that's really Martin Crawford is the person that really okay. writes in great detail great. on that. Robert's original book was quite philosophical and a bit short on technical detail although his garden was very beautiful um, but martin crawford is an amazing Great. researcher and, and his book creating a forest garden if you're wanting to do that is certainly the one i would Wonderful. recommend excellent well look um, thank you so much uh, arania for for coming on the show and for for sharing um you know your whole come from and your perspective and your experiences with teaching permaculture um wonderful to hear all this and for the listeners um contact uh, you can contact arania at uh, learn permaculture learn permaculture dot com yeah. and uh, also you might want to check out his book or any of those others those books uh, all those titles will be in in the show notes so um i hope you've all got some benefit from this uh, episode this is um sort of busting that myth that uh, that life just has to be this sort of um you know running on the old hamster wheel it, there are other ways of doing it, and I think permaculture is is a fantastic window into that. It, it's it's a, it, all of its principles and and everything that uh, Rania has shared with us today. I hope you find that inspiring, and uh, I do hope that you'll uh, join me again for another episode of Living Outside the Matrix. Change you want to see.